welcome to another episode of the Being and Doing podcast. Uh, today with me is a very, very special guest, uh, Daphne Haas Hogan. And I told her before that this is going to be what I'm going to say about her, but she is the most gentle, badass woman I have met. Uh, and... <laughs> And I am very curious to hear what's behind uh, this impression of mine I have of her and what's behind her story. And uh, she is a scientist and a doctor, as far as I know. And I'm very curious how she's reconciling these two roles and uh, being this gentle and incredible being. So welcome, Daphne. Thank you very much for the overly generous introduction, <laughs> but it's my pleasure. <laughs> So I start this podcast by asking, what are some words that you identify yourself with? And it can be anything like a noun, an adjective, just what you feel describes you a little bit. Uh, I'll, I'll throw out what comes to mind and mm -hmm. we can talk about it more. Um, so honesty integrity, mm. caring, um, uh, insecurity, mm. um, I think those are a good imposter syndrome, but I think that's probably universal to everybody that you interview. <laughs> mm. And I am curious about the, the integrity. It's something, it's a very important value of mine, the wholeness. Uh, and I'm, I'm wondering, how do you hold the integrity with the insecurity together? I think for all of us, there have to be a few, a few values that that are basically lines in the sand that we won't cross um, even when there's pressure on us to cross or we can even uh, hallucinate a reason or come up with stories in our brain why a certain line should be crossed or when right and wrong aren't always so clear. You know, mm. when things are black and white, it's easier, but Sometimes things are, are gray and you have to go back. And I, I find myself having to go back into myself and assess both from an emotional point of view, but also from a logical point of view, what, what's right here. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think integrity is one of those lines in the stands that personally I value so much that um, it's something that a line that can never be crossed. And if I'm uncertain where that line is, I know for myself, I have to take a step back and assess what overall is the right thing to do. Mm. Um, that's, in, for example, contradistinction to values such as transparency and honesty, mm. which are also very important. But for transparency, it's not always clear. I mean, clearly not everything in my brain should be should come out of my mouth. Um, but where is that line for me? And I tend to be a person who's more direct and more open and more honest, but I've also had to learn not to say everything on my mind. So that's an example of something where it's a little bit grayer um, for me um, sometimes. And I have to think about what should be uttered in words and what should stay in just in my brain. And I'm curious when when you are faced with the gray, which all of us are navigating, what is it that you helps you to get back in touch with yourself and just not swayed away by all the pressures or all the demands that I'm sure with someone with the career like yours has? I very often try to do two things. One is I tried to think about my experiences in the past and have I had a similar experience and what have I learned from it and what can that experience or even experience of somebody else who's told me about what they learned from, from, from their, uh, from their experience. What can I learn from that about the present situation? 
And then the second thing is I always try to put myself in the various people's shoes because sometimes we can judge the reaction of one person based on a perception of what we think is going on inside of them. But if we're curious and we ask, you know, what, what is going, what is going on for you that, that you would say that, or that you react in a certain way and what are you hoping for? What are you afraid of? What are you nervous about? What are your anxieties? What are your wishes? And when I try to put myself in the other person's position, position and a multitude of their positions, right? There, there are many people who bring, who, who come to the table and for every person, there actually might be um, many selves that they bring to the, to the table. We're not, we're not, uh, we're not, we, we have multitudes of um, drivers that, and, and, and we should be curious about all the, all the drivers. We're not unidimensional. So trying to put myself in other people's shoes and to understand where they're coming from has really helped me um, assess how to do right by, by them. Even when at first blush, it would seem that what they want or what, what they're asking for might be in conflict with what might feel right or wrong to me or what others are asking. Honestly, listening to you really makes me uh, like um, excited because uh, it feels that there is someone who sees the importance of understanding the drivers we have. And the way you are even asking this question is very therapeutic. <laughs> um, so I was very, very happy to hear that, that something like this exists in academia. And maybe we can actually also mention what you are, what is that you are doing um, and what is it that where you need to apply the skills in because I don't think people know exactly what your job is. <laughs> so I'm a, a radiation oncologist, so I treat cancer patients with radiation. I mostly treat uh, children mm. with cancer and adult patients with various kinds of brain tumors. Mm. And I also, with a wonderful leadership team, um, run the Department of Radiation Oncology at my institution. And I also have a laboratory that studies the genetic underpinnings, the genetic causes for various kinds of cancer, especially childhood cancers and brain tumors, mm -hmm. and why or why, or why not they might respond to treatment. Mm. So there I have a question for maybe people that don't know uh, much about brain tumors because I know that they are maybe one of the most aggressive tumors we know uh, and I can imagine that working with patients having these tumors is very humbling uh, and it definitely would inform your science and the integrity you have in your science so I am curious how is the communication between science your science and your clinical work helping you to do better science so it's interesting. I remember even being interviewed for medical school mm -hmm. and the, the interviewer who was a very, very talented and successful MD PhD kept pushing me and saying, and pushing and pushing and saying, well, if you had to decide between being a physician and being a scientist, if you just had to decide, what would you choose? What would you choose? And he pushed me really hard. And I remember I was maybe 20 or 21 years old. And I just remember being very honest and saying, I really don't know. I can't imagine giving up either in my career. And of course, I think that when one focuses more on the clinical aspect of, of cancer therapy or more on the scientific laboratory discovery part, part of, of uh, cancer research, one can have a deeper dive and, and very deep expertise. But for me, um, I've never been able to choose one or the other, even when it's very, very difficult and, and demanding and stressful. I think because 
Um, I'm so passionate about clinical medicine. I, I just, I feel like I'm in love with all of my patients. I just love seeing them. I love hearing their stories and listening to what they need and how I can be helpful. But it's also often very sad because the majority of the patients that I treat just so happens that I treat, as, as, as you mentioned, very aggressive cancers. The majority of the patients that I treat um, will succumb to their to their cancer. And I, I think it would just be too emotionally hard if I didn't also, um, if I wasn't also able to go to the laboratory and work with just genius people like you and others in your laboratory who see how important it is to uncover the molecular determinants of our of the cancer and come up with novel therapies that will ultimately cure patients that right now we can't cure so the it's the interplay for me between the clinical care and the science that keeps me going i i love the laboratory for a thousand reasons, but also I love it because I can see its application to the clinic. And I love the clinic for, you know, thousands of reasons, but to a large extent, because I can see how everything that we do in the lab might make it better for the next patient that comes to me tomorrow or next week or next month. So it gives me both invigoration, but also um, intellectual satisfaction and um, hope, which is ultimately what we all need. And I'm curious in your, I don't know how many years long career, but um, what have you seen going forward uh, that gives you hope to continue going forward? Yeah, so it's been a little over 20 years now of my career. And there are patients that I remember treating 25 years ago as a trainee um, that, that we treated after a, com a long conversation with them and with their family. And much of the conversation revolved around the fact that, okay, we could treat you with, um, with this drug, excuse me, or we could treat you with radiation, but this is not going to be curative. And we, we might, improve your quality of life for a short time, but ultimately we fear that you're gonna succumb relatively quickly to your disease. And I remember so many times having these conversations um, with patients and, and just how difficult it was to then come back the next day or the next day or the next week or the, or the next month. And indeed um, they were deteriorating and they would succumb to their disease. And I see those exact same patients now that are basically cured. Um, so for example, the, our understanding of um, the molecular aberrations in certain kind of tumors that escape to the central nervous system and, and result in brain metastases, before those patients will have been treated with radiation to the entirety of the brain. And number one, that was very toxic. And number two, we wouldn't cure them ever. And now with uh, the combination of understanding the, the genetic drivers behind the tumor, there are targeted inhibitors, biological agents that can literally cure these patients. With our in, in, increased understanding of immunotherapy, and how to harness the immune system to fight the tumor and with technological innovations in how we administer radiation, where we can accurately target just the metastasis and spare the rest of the brain radiation. All of those together have led to so many of my patients that I treated when I just arrived at Harvard six years ago, and I still see them week after week and month after month and year after year, and they're at work and they're celebrating life with their children and with their grandchildren. 
and um, being able to see them have continue with their wonderful lives has really been transformational. Those were not patients that would be seeing the graduations of their children and the births of their grandchildren and have continued to contribute to to make this world a better place without the discoveries that the scientific discoveries that scientists have made. And I think this is actually a really good point to ask the question um, of success. And because you are talking about this huge difference that has happened already in your lifetime. And what do you see as success? Because uh, again, we are talking about very difficult cases and sometimes sometimes it's not curative, but there is still a little bit of sense of success. So what, what do you feel that success is in your work or in your everyday moments? So, of course, a relatively bland answer is that success is when we cure a patient or we improve their quality of life, we alleviate their pain. And those are pretty straightforward kinds of success. But I think success, there are so many meanings to success. Um, for me, honestly, sometimes success is just being able to be present with a patient. And when they express their fear, when they express their desire not to die, um, when they express um, their fear of being alone or being in pain, that I'm just able to hold the space. And maybe it's just to hold their hand. and the temptation is so great to tell people it's gonna be okay, but sometimes it's not gonna be okay. So for me, sometimes success is just being able to be present and truthful, but also to inspire hope. And uh, sometimes it's hard to hold all those different feelings together in the same room, in the same hand, in the same hug, in the same relationship, in the same conversation. Um, but, but for me, that is so often success. Success is very much driven by what success is for my patient. Um, they might, they, they have their own set of values and, and what's important to them. It might be to live as long as they can at almost any cost. It might be to have the most um, dignified of deaths, whatever that means to them. It might mean to die in the presence of loved ones. It might mean to accomplish something um, in a certain amount of time. Um, it might mean that they want to contribute to research through contribution of their tissue or through asking, talking to me about my research or to others about their research. So again, it, this harps back to your prior conversation. It's so often um, being curious about what success means to my patient or my colleague or my patient's family and being in tune with that, their definition of success, and then being able to, as best I can, deliver on what their wishes and desires and fears are that is a success for me and not to impose my set of values on them, but just to be in tune with what they might want from me. Uh, while you're talking about this, I remember you said caring, and, and that really comes through when you talk about your patients. And honestly, I, I kind of had this, yeah, holding the complexity of life, and you are really at that verge of the complexity, and even in my psychotherapy training, we had the questions, how do you hold hope in hopeless places? And I'm curious if you have your version of an answer to this question. It's such a hard question because for me, it's, um, it's such a feeling driven endeavor. And it has so much to do with how 
we frame a conversation. So when a person is originally diagnosed and we don't really know um, what the, the trajectory of their disease will be. Um, and they, and we know that their prognosis might be poor, but we know that there is a chance for cure, even if it's, if it's small, um, being able to have, a, an open conversation about the hopefulness of research that's being done. And as we just discussed the immense progress that has been done from a scientific point of view. And then I think that's very much. Uh, a source of hope um, early on in the trajectory of a disease and, and maybe also in, in the middle of, of a treatment. Maybe one treatment didn't work, but then we have an, uh, an emerged understanding of another kind of agent, another systemic agent or another approach that might work. And the hopefulness of um, uh, treatments that emerge from scientific understanding that uh, has so often proven beneficial for patients. So that's one aspect of hope that's associated with in, um, enhanced understanding of the complexity of cancer and the drivers of cancer. And then there's a different kind of hope that I think is very unique, but comes towards the end of life. And it's the, the hope to um, not die alone, um, the hope to not die in pain, the hope to have a sense of immortality by the goodness that you've done on earth and the way you've touched other people and the way you've um, been kind and um, done right by, by others. And I think there's a lot of, of hope in knowing that even with the horror of cancer that we are going to die of, um, the, the way that we live on through others, maybe through our children, but also maybe through our partner or our friends or others, um, our communities that we, that we have touched, I think also offers a different kind of hope, but a very, very important kind of hope. And I would like to hear more about your trajectory. What attracted you to this vocation? Because I really feel you live your work. Um, and what enables you to be also enriched by it and not only drained by the difficulty of, of what you hold? I think looking way back at my childhood, um, both of my parents are Holocaust survivors, and they were they were very young children. One was born right before the war, and one was born in the middle of the war, of World War II. And the they were both saved through the kindness of others. In fact, the kindness of strangers that didn't know them and had never met them or their families, and that has always inspired me and driven and driven me to pay that kindness forward. And, you know, all you need to do is kind of look at the world today and see what, um, what horrors happen to people, some through just terrible luck, but some through um, the cruelty of others. And, so I, I feel constantly, constantly driven to kind of counteract the, the pain in the world by trying to pay forward um, the, the, the kindness and selflessness that was shown to my family um, by others. And even now when I um, read the paper or look at stories, of selfless kindness that others have shown other human beings or um, other breathing beings. It just, it, 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 it drives me so deeply to 
follow in their in their footsteps to augment and amplify um, kindness that I see that I see around me. So for for people with cancer, of course, you know, so the individuals just had incredibly bad luck to have this horrible struggle. So my ability to walk a path with them, um, you know, hold their hand, hold their family's hand through something so horrible, be, be available. I mean, I know that um, when I'm really nervous about my health or my child's health or my parents' health or my partner's health, that I want to be able to get in touch with, with somebody who can assuage my anxiety. So I want my patients to have my cell phone so or my email so they can reach out to me and I can assuage their anxiety when, when they're feeling um, unsettled or scared. And similarly, um, when I see cruelty done by human beings to other human beings, first of all, it makes me so angry. Um, but also being able to uh, try to contribute to um, the goodness um, of others um, is really, I mean, makes me get up in the morning and really makes me tick. In fact, I often think that my, in, in some ways, my job is easier. One of my closest, closest friend, friends is actually a judge, and she sees, um, for example, she sees um, children, she has to judge cases where children were abused by others. And I often say to her, I, I think her, she says to me, oh, you have such a hard job. And I say, well, you have the hardest job because my patients had really bad luck and I just get to be with them and ask them what they need and give my entire being, um, devote my entire being to what they might need and how I can help. But she actually has to see people being cruel to other people. And how do you even, how do you take that and digest that in your head and then try to make things right? That's like a whole another level of, of challenge. Um, so we, we, we very, very often talk about where we find the strength to, and where we find the inspiration. To, to go to work, even when we're tired or, or discouraged. So I think big picture, um, observing and learning from the kindness of others and wanting to um, pay that forward is what makes me tick. And sometimes when I'm super tired or I get or even I'm impatient and I was like, oh, I can't deal with this right now. I just take a step back and I take a deep breath and I think, oh, you're in a very privileged position that maybe you can do something to help now. So just do it. Wow. Uh, actually, now that you're talking about privilege, um, another question is, um, how do you think of power and privilege and I have gotten many answers that have changed my perspective of power and po how power can be used for good and what how do you see it so when I when I came to Harvard and I took over the leadership for the department I was very conscious of the fact that I had more power than I had had in by the um by the position I was now holding than I'd had in my in my previous life um, as a physician and a, and a clinician scientist. Um, and I did a lot of thinking about what that means and a lot and a lot of introspection. And I'm very, I'm consistently conscious of the fact that I really do think that power is very corrupting. And that it's very easy to get the taste of power and to forget that, um, to forget how important it is to always, always, always check with oneself 
what is motivating you here? Are you after glory? Are you after money? Are you after, what are you after here in the decision that you're making? And then to step back and then make absolutely a thousand percent sure that the decision that I'm making is for the goodness of others and the goodness of the community and the goodness of the organization and not for a, a personal benefit. And um, I'm super aware of the fact that power can be intoxicating and that I can never, never, ever make decisions for that are um, self-promoting or self-serving and just constantly being aware of the dangers, the corrupting danger of power is um, critical for me um, in the decisions I make and the way I lead. Um, of course, many of us are in very privileged positions and thinking about how um, basically we're here because of luck. I mean, I, I don't, I have no fantasy that I'm here for, because I've done something special. I'm here because I was the person at the right time with the right background, um, at the right, in the right situation. And recognizing that most of us are where we are um, because of luck highlights the fact that people who have less than us have less than us also because of, of bad luck. So what I get to do to promote others is, there's, is, is key. And I, I never flatter myself to think that um, I've achieved anything because of any way that I'm special, but rather um, I was lucky enough to get to where I am. And now what I have to do is make sure that I um, infuse other people's lives with, with similar luck through mentorship and support and kindness and um, caring. Thanks a lot for sharing this. I, I think it's maybe you may be one of the first people I've heard acknowledging that and being aware of that um, and how much actually where we are, who we know just shapes our path. Um, of course, there is some of our competences that contribute to that, but that's not the only thing that that does it, that does the job. And um, I actually wanted to ask you also about your gender and your path as a woman uh, in science and in academia, or let's say just in a very competitive environment. Um, and now I'm listening to you and I'm just noticing that you have managed to keep the community spirit in a competitive environment. And I just admire that. So I'm curious how. <laughs> I think I realized at some point that the potential to impact the world and benefit others and do good is so immense that um, that competition is really undermining, in fact. And when we see the, the potential to benefit others and benefit the world as a zero-sum game, and if, if I'm able to contribute a lot, that means that somebody else will be able to contribute less then you're always vying for the, the, or you might vie for making the greater contribution. And, and that can mean different things to different people. So the recognition or the publishing the next big paper or the next big clinical trial, whatever that is, if you see, if you see the contributions that one can make to others and to the world as a zero sum game, um, then of course you're going to focus on co on competition, but for but for me it's never a zero sum game. There's always more to do, and in fact, if we work together, 
the contributions will be amplified and the whole will always be greater than the sum of its parts. I think of it as um, a candle lighting another candle or, you know, just when a candle lights another candle, it doesn't make the first candle shine any less bright, right? It's the ability to give light that doesn't detract from your light ever. And now you just have two candles. And that's how I think about my, our world and our lives in that um, shining a light on others just makes the light greater and our contribution is greater. So um, even when I feel, uh, when I feel like I'm put back on my heels or maybe I feel locked up into a corner or maybe I feel bitter about somebody and I feel like somebody scooped me or somebody is um, uh, diminished of my accomplishments or something, I immediately catch myself and say to myself, you know, what are you doing? You know, this doesn't matter. Um, Back it up and remember why we're here and that uh, don't infuse negative or um, motivations onto others. You have no idea what went in through their brain. Think well of others, think, think well of the organization, think well of the community and work together to um, enhance the, 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 the betterment of our, our entire community. So sometimes I definitely have to step back and remind myself um, not to be competitive, um, but generally speaking, it, you know, with enough practice, it comes much more naturally to remember uh, the greater good. And uh, for the sake of time, this will be the last question um, uh, before we wrap up. But um, there are also places where boundaries are really important. And we can think well of others and still know that these are not the people we can collaborate with. And how do you support yourself to make those decisions? And how do you support yourself when you feel like your light is depleted? Those interactions are probably some of the toughest interactions for me because kind of how I lead my life is thinking well of others and always trying to assume wonderful intentions. But like you say, sometimes it's just not true. And I don't want to live like Pollyanna. Um, Sometimes it's just... uh, Sometimes it just isn't true. And I find that I take those interactions very, very hard and they um, really get me down because they rattle my whole um, image of where I fit into the world and how to do good in the world. Um, And that's on a personal level, on a communal level, but also sometimes in the world when I see people who really are cruel, it's just so hard for me to deal with. It kind of shatters my worldview. Um, So I try to um, surround myself with um, positive individuals. I try to talk to my friends and to my colleagues and to, um, read books, um, listen to music, um, spend time with, uh, I have a wonderful community of family and friends and colleagues that I try to surround myself even more when that uh, worldview gets shattered by unkindness that I see. Um, But it definitely um, hits me very, very hard. And honestly, is a, a part of both my personal life and um, my work life that's very hard for me to incorporate um, and to stay positive even when I come across interactions that really aren't positive. So I think we, we need to wrap up here, but uh, I will just ask a small question. Is there an absurd thing about you that not many people know about? An absurd thing about me? not um hmm. 
my family would say there are many absurd things about me. Um, I'll tell you a, a fun fact that very few people know. For some reason, when I turned 40, I decided that I was um, obsessed with um, belly button, with navel rings. Okay. I was like, okay, it's my 40th birthday. I'm going to go get my belly button pierced. (laughs) You think that you would do that when you were 18 and not when you're 40. But for some crazy reason, I decided that I was going to do it when I was 40. So if you see me on the beach with a bikini, you'll know that. But otherwise, you would not know that. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for sharing that. Well, really, I want to thank you for, for your time, for your kindness, for your presence and for everything you do. Thank you so much. Well, I will. I do have to say that it's people like you that inspire me. I remember the very first time that we were on a Zoom call and we actually were talking science and about um, uh, a discovery and a drug and a project you were actually involved in that um, I thought and I still think is really going to be transformational for some of our patients. And just the way you approached your science and the way you approached um, translational research to the clinical realm um, was so inspiring for me because I know that it's because people like you are in the field that it's going to be better for our patients. And that's what ultimately gives me the most hope and the most confidence and the most positivity in my life. So thank you. Oh, wow. This this lands really, really deep. Thank you very much. (laughs) You have just heard the story of Daphne Haskogan, American radiation oncologist. She received her medical degree from the University of California at San Francisco in 1991. She completed a research fellowship followed by residency in radiation oncology at the UCSF. Dr. Haskogan spent 18 years as a radiation oncologist, researcher, and academic leader in the UCSF system before becoming the chair of the Department of Radiation Oncology at Dana-Farber, Bergam and Women's Hospital and Boston Children's Hospital in 2015. Thank you for joining me on this journey, and I hope you will like and subscribe so that our stories can reach more people.